following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be, whenever you may be. You are listening to Ask Claire along the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And I am Claire Hall, your regular host, and now it is my pleasure on episode number three of this edition of the podcast to introduce my sometimes co-host, a a great friend, Gabriel Schechter. Gabriel, good evening, since we're recording in the evening. (laughs) Good evening, Claire. Always nice to talk with you. Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of fun, and I think people have probably who who listen to Comfortably Zoned have heard both of us. I'm uh, 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 I've been a host, and you have been a frequent guest. So uh, on this program, I think uh, it would be nice if we just let people get to know each of us, our shared interests, and maybe uh, talk about some of our ideas for. Uh, future programs. So uh, how about the Gabriel Schechter story in a few minutes? And maybe as a setup, I'll mention, uh, you know, it was certainly a shared love of baseball that brought us together. But I think as we've had the pleasure of getting to know each other, we found, uh, you know, our common interests go far deeper than that. But uh, for the next several minutes, at least, it's not all about me. It's all about you, sir. Uh, And what has gotten me where I am today, talking with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Yes, uh, like a lot of uh, my baseball friends, we met on uh, Facebook, Mm -hmm. just uh, as so many of us do, making comments on the same posts and uh, sending a friend request. And that was maybe, what, five, six years ago? I don't know. I think so. I think so. I moved back to Oregon at the end of 2017. I guess that's the relevant uh, story mm-hmm. to tell. I uh, I was raised in New Jersey and grew up when I left. Uh, and, yeah, four and a half minutes for this one. This is a quick mm-hmm. version of it. When I was uh, 18 years old in college, I was laid up in the infirmary with chicken pox, of all things. And I read John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. The book Mm -hmm. changed my life. At that point, I had never been south or west of Philadelphia. Wow. And I read Steinbeck's travel uh, across and around the country, and I thought, I have to see the country. And the following Mm -hmm. summer, after my freshman year of college, I uh, took my first cross-country trip, 33 days, over 8,000 miles, saw all kinds of cities and parks and you name it. And from the time uh, I saw the Badlands in South Dakota, Mm -hmm. I fell in love with the American West. To the point where when it came time to go to graduate school, I applied only to schools in the West. And Mm -hmm. I wound up at the University of Oregon, even though I had not gone to Oregon on on my trip. Steinbeck Mm -hmm. certainly had. And uh, I spent two years here in the mid-70s getting a master's degree in English. Then I went off to the University of Montana, uh, a job I pursued, even though I hadn't been to Montana either, but in, in Travels with Charlie, Steinbeck was so in love with Montana that he said, I can't even write about it. I'm that much in love with it. And on that basis, I went to Montana, where I learned kids to write good for a few years. Mm-hmm. And uh, from there, went to Las Vegas for a long time. I uh, was a poker dealer, went to California, lived in a redwood forest where I started writing baseball books, then spent 15 years in the Cooperstown area, worked at the Hall of Fame for a while, mm-hmm. and uh, did more writing. And... Uh, Three years ago, my wife Linda died, and uh, I knew I didn't want to stay in upstate New York anymore after mm-hmm. after that 43-inch snowfall one day. Oh, and I had to decide, uh, well, where do I really want to be? 
and I could go any of the places I've lived, I would go back to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I really thought about it, the answer was Oregon. So here That's I true. am. And uh, great. it took very little time for me to to uh, to realize that I made absolutely the right decision. I fell in love with Oregon in the two years I lived here when I didn't know better. The, the beauty of the state and the character of the people. And mm-hmm. uh, the state is at least as beautiful and the people are at least as great as I remembered them. That's nice to hear. That's nice to hear. As uh, you know, there's more than 4 million people in Oregon now. When I was a child, there were only 2 million of us. So I hear some of the old timers say, uh, you know, it's not the state it used to be. It's gotten too crowded. Uh, you know, th- this isn't the way it was in the rosy days of my youth. But it's nice <laughs> to know yep. somebody who lived here decades ago and has come home still found that, I don't know what I'd call it, Oregon magic maybe. So very good. Well, a few of the things uh, that I remember from back then, of course, we were. I hung out with all the, the graduate students, and we we were all on food stamps. And Oregon was a nice place to be if you were poor, which we were. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, but it, the the economy was good, and people seemed prosperous, but not in the uh, showy way that I had grown up with in the suburbs of New York. In the mm-hmm. wilds of the suburbs, it was a very live and let live attitude, and that is what mm-hmm. has prevailed. As as I've told you, uh, and you being a native, are uh, mm-hmm. just you know a fine example yeah. of of what I see as the the native default mentality, which I have not experienced elsewhere. And and it goes, we're in Oregon, we got it pretty good up here. If we look out for each other and don't screw with each other, it'll be that much better. And it is. Well, that that touches my heart because Oregon, you know, I've I've kept my mind open to the possibility that my journeys will take me elsewhere someday. But except for uh, my year in graduate school, I have spent... Uh, all 60 of my years, and I can say it in less than two weeks, I hit the big six zero <laughs> in Oregon. And, you know, I I really hope to see more, more of the world than I have. But if there is one place that I end up spending most of my life, I'm, I'm glad it's Oregon. And get back to how we connected. You know, I'm I'm pretty sure you sent the friend request to me. And, you know, when I'm evaluating friend requests from people I don't know in regular, you know, in in regular life, face to face, I look at do we have a lot of mutual friends? And, of course, then we already had a ton of mutual friends. But immediately I said, ah, Gabriel Schechter, the guy who wrote the biography of Victory Faust. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it clicked in immediately. So, uh, you know, share again. I think, uh, I think for both of us, the appeal of this game is it has had so many memorable characters. And you did a very, very, very outstanding job of telling the story of uh, one of them. So, you know, give us again the nutshell. Who was Charles Victory Faust and your journey to telling <laughs> the story? Well, my journey was uh, about a 25-year journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, Victory Faust was uh, like a real-life Forrest Gump. Mm-hmm. I would argue that he was the least athletic man ever to play Major League Baseball. You might say Eddie Goodell, but I don't think Goodell was allowed to play. Yeah. Charlie Faust played. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was uh, the village idiot from a little town, farm town in Kansas. And uh, in July of 1911, he showed up in St. Louis where the New York Giants were visiting. 
And he uh, wandered down out of the stands in his Sunday clothes, wanted to talk to John McGraw and said, Mr. McGraw, uh, my name's Charlie Faust, I'm from, and I saw a fortune teller who told me I will pitch the Giants to the championship. Here I am. McGraw was superstitious and gave him a little tryout. He had absolutely no ability. They had some laughs at his expense. They ran him around the bases, mm -hmm. and he tore up the Sunday clothes and was covered with dust. But they let him. Mm -hmm. They let him hang around. They won nine nothing. He showed up the next day, and they won four nothing. And they stranded him at the station. McGraw didn't want to take him on the road any further, and. They kind of floundered the rest of the road trip, got back to the polo grounds, and Faust was waiting for them. He had <laughs> hopped the freights because he knew they needed him. He had room in his head for one big idea, and it was that he was going to pitch them to the title. So he joined them, and he became their uh, their mascot, their good luck charm, which uh, which was common back then, and, and the star of the pregame show. The pregame show... Uh, activities lasted longer than the games did. There would be band performances, batting, fielding, extensive mm -hmm. practice, and he became the star of it. He uh, and they never lost. When Amazing. he was in uniform, doing his bit, from the time he first joined them, they went thirty-six and three to to, cl to clinch the pennant. Uh huh. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a ridiculous number. It's it's astonishing. But he did it. He uh, McGraw McGraw was very harsh with his players, and they got all this comic relief from Faust. He was so gullible. They they played the same practical jokes on him every day. He was with them. Wow. He got a vaudeville gig. Left the team for three days. They lost twice in time. He he quit vaudeville because they needed him. They went on the road. He struck out Hannes Wagner in batting practice. The, and eventually, after they clinched, he got in two games. He pitched two innings. He only gave up mm -hmm. one run. He came to bat in the last inning of the season. Uh, they hit him with a pitch intentionally and let him steal second and third. The Giants set the record that year with 347 stolen bases. Victory Faust got the last two. That's, you know, what a, it's, it's what a an amazing great, story. Great yeah. History. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I would imagine the memory of Victory Faust, you know, probably was almost uh, faded by the early 1960s when Lawrence Ritter came along and really yeah. wrote one of the most memorable baseball books of all, The Glory of Their Times. And, uh, my, yeah. Yeah. Right, my father lot, my, right? my my father brought me that book. I was fifteen years old that summer. Mm -hmm. My father brought me the book. I still have it. Uh Ritter signed it for me in nineteen ninety eight. Oh wow. Uh yeah. Uh and uh Fred Snodgrass, the center fielder on that Giants team, told the story. Mm -hmm. And a uh, rather elaborate story. And uh, in the 70s, when I was a young, aspiring novelist, I wrote a modernization of the story. I gave them to the Cubs. This was the 70s. I gave them to the mm -hmm. Cubs, the Red Sox, and uh, rewrote it a few times over the years and really was going to give them to the Red Sox, who seemed to need a miracle the most. Uh -huh. And uh, in 1991, I went to Cooperstown and doing research, and there was two little clippings there on Faust. I went mm -hmm. uh, to the state library, got on microfilm, looking at old newspapers, and that led to research, which eventually uncovered uh, over 300 newspaper items about Faust, mm -hmm. and. The true story was much funnier, more moving and poignant than anything I was trying to invent. So I wound up writing the uh, the true story instead. 
and uh, an amazing story it is, and very well told. So, well, thank you. I think, it, yeah. Well, I think it's fair to say. Sh- 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 uh, uh, <laughs> it's easy for you to say. Person, <laughs> and at the end of the day, I'm having trouble talking. But I think it would be fair to say a lot of the programs we do together are going to focus on baseball. We both have. A lot of uh, friends and acquaintances who can uh, explore the many, many sides Mm -hmm. of the rich history of this game. But, uh, you know, also I think maybe we we won't uh, restrict ourselves to baseball because uh, I think it's fair to say we are both – very passionate book people and uh, uh that's that was the uh, first thing i was going to bring up yeah 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 that's uh, that's a great commonality and uh you know love of literature a love of uh a love of um yeah hi- history <laughs> great biography and uh, just i think just playing good ra- ra- just playing good yeah. writing Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so writing, uh, good writing is one of the things that it is. Uh, it's a gratuitous pleasure. Yeah. You know, oh, you you, c- yeah. you can admire good writing even if uh, it is a redeeming feature. Oh yeah, I was talking of, of, to of a lot of colleague. things we read. Yeah, I was talking to a colleague this afternoon and about our mutual appreciation of. Uh, Robert Caro's works, you know, the masterful four volume mm-hmm. going on, uh, hopefully a fifth and final volume about Lyndon Johnson and his great story about New York's, ma- his great book about New York's master builder, uh, Robert Caro. And we talked, to, I mean, I'm sorry, Robert Moses. Moses. Uh, I don't even want to utter the, his name, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, that'll block about that name to you. I guess so. Uh, yeah, we may get into that at some point. But, uh, you know, the fact that uh, he's a historian, he gives you a mass of detail, which, of course, is only a tiny sliver of what he's uncovered in his research. But would you agree there is such a richness, a richness to his writing? I mean, you know, in, in in his most recent book, where he talks a bit about researching uh, his other books, he, he talks about interviewing uh, Sam Houston Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, <laughs> at, Lyndon Johnson's brother at the Johnson family dining table at the Johnson <laughs> place, yeah. and having Sam Houston sit at the spot where he sat. Uh, he sat and Caro sat where Lyndon sat, and he wanted to capture <laughs> things like what did the light look like at the family's usual dinner time. I mean, just you know, it, it, I think in a lesser writer's hand, that mass of material would have been it's just uh, over. Claire, I, I, I would I would call that the I would call that the literary equivalent of method acting. Ah, just it, 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 Im- immersing yourself in in all the backstory and the background yeah. of a character in order to bring out oh, the character. Yeah. Mhm, mhm. Well, you know that triggers another story, and uh, you know I <laughs> everything love... triggers a story. <laughs> of course, yeah. You've gotten to know. I've told you about my ping pong brain, and that's one of the reasons I appreciate you, my friend. Is you put up with my ping ponging? But I don't think I've ever asked you. Are you a fan of the works of the historian David McCullough? His most famous book is probably his biography of Harry Truman. He also Truman, has a yeah. Of John Adams, but like for instance, when Truman was in Sam Rayburn's private hideaway at the U.S. Capitol on April twelfth, nineteen forty-five, and he got uh-huh. a call that he needed to go to the White House, but not why. But somehow later, Truman said he knew he knew what was up. And he said he went on, for a 60-year-old man, a pretty fast trot to where the car would be waiting for him to pick it, him up. So uh, 
So David McCullough got permission from the Capitol Police to run that exact route because he wanted to be able to, again, put himself in the scene and describe exactly what uh, Truman would have seen whizzing past as he headed to his day well, of destiny. I, uh, I almost did something like that. I, uh, I, I stood where Victory Faust stood when he pitched mm-hmm. a complete game in spring training in 1912. He went to Hot Springs, Arkansas, on mm-hmm. his own to teach mm-hmm. himself to pitch left-handed so he'd be twice as valuable. And oh he was he was allowed to pitch a whole game, eight innings. Wow. Wow. Fittingly, it was on February 29th. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there was cooperation for the other team, but... In uh, in 2002, th- the Sabres Dead Ball Era Committee had their first uh, boiling out in Hot Springs that I was part of. And we went to the ballpark where that game took place, and I stood where Faust would have stood. Some of the grandstand is still, still uh, oh, wow. there. Yeah. Wow. So, almost. Yeah. It's the same principle. And what did uh, Hemingway yeah. once said? Uh, you know, I'm quoting from memory, but I know Roger Kahn used it for the title of one of his books, and it was something about the good and the bad, the agony and the ecstasy, and I think he had something else and the sorrow. No, the, the, the good, the bad, the agony, the ecstasy, and the sorrow, and how the weather is. If you can give... <laughs> people all of that then you are a writer (laughs) tall order ernie but hey you know you know uh uh if you're gonna aspire to 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 uh you know or, or on another note how about um uh, another one of our favorite figures, Casey Stengel, uh, who I think once gave the sage advice to a young hitter. Was, or what? No, it was Yogi Berra. God, I'm slipping tonight. If you can't imitate him, don't copy him. <laughs> Which wouldn't you say for an aspiring writer, that means study the greats, but you ultimately have to find your own style, your own voice. Well, that was certainly the case for me. I certainly fell into that. My uh, mm-hmm. my first uh, novel had three na- three narrators, all of whom mm-hmm. imitated a favorite writer. Ah, one was Conrad, one was Salinger. My second novel, I, I tried to write a whole uh, Raymond Chandler kind of a novel. And then later mm-hmm. I tried to write a whole novel in uh, Damon Runyon's style because I had wow. written a lot of wow. short stories in that style. And it, it really wasn't until I wrote uh, Victory Spouse and started writing nonfiction that I did find my voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was, yeah, and I was in my 40s by then. Interesting thought. Um yeah, so I think we will definitely, a theme that we'll be returning to probably again and again on this program is not just uh, great baseball writing, but great baseball writing, period. And, uh, you know, original voices, voices that have uh, made a lasting mark. You know, I want to tell folks, uh, you kind of helped me discover somebody recently. He's dead 30 uh-huh. years, but yet his voice is so alive to me right now. And I've gone, I've just raced through about half a dozen of his books and that's uh, <laughs> Edward Abbey. And I think, uh, and I think I ping ponged Edward Abbey as you were talking about uh, imitating other writers. And, uh, you know, we've talked about the fact <laughs> yes. that his very first published novel, Jonathan Troy, he uh, he hated it in retrospect. Absolutely uh, left instructions that it was to never be reprinted. But I remember reading his self critique, and he one of the things that he quickly hated as soon as he saw it in print was he felt like almost every chapter was his attempt to badly imitate one of his favorite writers. <laughs> yes, and yeah, I'm sure uh, I'm sure he's right about that. 
Yeah, and yet. But it's probably you know, something you have to get out of your system, you know. Exactly. Exactly. The question yet, is look, is finding the voice, not not plowing through all the all the invitations. I wanted to mention mm-hmm. since you brought Abby sure. up. Uh-huh. Uh, the theme of books. I'm 68, mm-hmm. and three of my favorite writers that I've already read over and will continue to are, are writers I had never read at all a decade ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one is Abby, yeah. uh, one of Linda's co-workers at the hospital in uh, Cooperstown gave her uh, Fool's Progress. A, a late mm-hmm. novel to read, and that was the first one that we read. And from there, we zoomed through everything else and had. Uh, I read uh, the Monkey Wrench Gang to her twice. The second time in the in the shadow of Glen Canyon Dam. The first oh, time I read part of it to her from across the water from the uh, bush compound in Kennebunkport, Maine. Mm-hmm. Symbolic. Mm-hmm. Um, but the two others, uh, I want to mention the two others. One is Zane Gray, uh-huh. uh, whom I first read six years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, Riders of the Purple Sage, purchased at Wall Drugs in Wall, South Dakota, on a cross country oh. trip with Linda. Perfect. And I've now read uh, about 50 of his novels. I'm starting to read them for the second time. Wow, he was uh, prolific. Yep. Yes. And the third uh-huh. one is Edwin Way Teal, T-E-A-L-E. Yes. Yep, you've just been reading him as well. I have, let's see, I first read him like two and a half years ago. I taught for a semester at uh, SUNY Herkimer in upstate New York. Mm-hmm. And they had a library library sale one day, and I got five amazing books for a dollar. One was uh, Peter Matheson's The Snow Leopard. I got mm-hmm. uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos. I got a an Einstein collection, and I got a book by Edwin Way Teal. And the, the name caught my eye because mm-hmm. he's mentioned many times in a favorite old book, uh, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard, mm-hmm. which won a Pulitzer mm-hmm. Prize 40 or so years ago. She was a naturalist, and it's about her spending uh, a year or two in the Tidewater in Virginia and oh, wow. interested in the same things that fascinated Teal, which is small life, insects, plants, uh, the small animals that you see around you. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, Teal. A wonderful writer. He mm-hmm. he won a Pulitzer in the early 50s for a series of books, one about each season, where he and his wife traveled all around the country to the places where wildlife were most abundant, uh, prominent sites along migration routes, uh, uh, things like that, and they, by season. And that series of books... Uh, won a Pulitzer, but he wrote one that they bought a farm up in northeast Connecticut. And he mm-hmm. wrote this two or three books about the farm that I've read, but one called A Walk Through the Year. Every day of the year, what they saw or heard or discovered on their walk on that date. And I read that day's entry every every morning to start my uh, my daily reading. The way some people read a read a passage of scripture. I read that wow. day's entry from uh, from Teal. He's a wonderful writer. Just, uh, I love it. He was, a man, he was a man chosen to edit John Muir's writings. Wow. Wow. That's, that is yeah, that was, his, that was his stature. Yeah. And, yeah. So your three favorite writers you've all discovered in the last decade. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, that... You know, uh, I hate so it's to never too late. Problem. Go out and discover yeah. writers. Yeah, but but you know, we're running out of time, uh, <laughs> uh, my friend. But and we're only getting and we're only getting started. 
<laughs> exactly. Well, how about a final? I'll offer up my final profound thought for the evening, and then if you have one, I'll I'll, I'll good luck. You to that. But, yeah, this is fun, and and I didn't come up with it just now. It was an epiphany that I had to think about, and I posted on Facebook at one point, and I and here was I think how I expressed it. I ju- I have finally realized that I will die with a list an, an impossibly long list of unread books. That is Oh my, my goodness. Great, that is my great joy and my great sorrow. <laughs> it's a uh well being a bibliophile is is, is a Sisyphean uh, undertaking. Oh yeah, yeah. But as you say, you know, every the difference is every step you take has meaning and joy in, of its own. Mhm, mhm. I've read I've read ninety books this year, and yeah. we're what two thirds wow. of the way through. Yeah. Mhm, mhm. That's a good use of time, and I, uh, I'll uh, and uh, yeah, oh, you've always got a friend when you've got a book in hand, and. Oh. Uh, <sighs> You know, with that aphorism, I think I will say thank you, Gabriel. <laughs> what a great launch to uh, our uh, programs together, and wish you all a ple- wish you a pleasant evening. Thank everybody. Thank you. You too. Yeah, and I'll use the sign off I've come up with, which is famously hey. stolen. But you think about for a next program hey. if you come up with something better, huh? Mine is happy trails until we meet again. <laughs> <laughs> that works see for next, me. <laughs> okay, see you next time, everybody. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.